everybody, and welcome to another ex exciting episode of Radio Rama. Where, as the name implies, I show you how to work on radios, televisions, stereos, all that jazz stuff that tends to run on glowing vacuum tubes. And today, I'm about to start on a project that I might very well really regret. I think it's because I've worked on this model probably three times, and they are a god awful mess. It's a 1940 Philco. I've already forgot the model number. Where is the model number information? It's usually inside. Let's see, 41 300. It's a 41 model, but probably started selling in 40. It is a 12 tube set, which is impressive, especially for that time period. It's in exceptionally wonderful physical condition. Uh, these were not cheap when they were new. There was actually a model above this one that had motorized tuning with the remote control mystery box option. And I've seen those, and they're nuts. You literally had a big box in your hand, and you would dial it to the station you wanted, and this would m automatically follow it. That must have blown people's minds. I don't think it's had a lot of use, because usually... This, these decals and stuff get worn off from use. There's not a lot of dirt. It looks like we have local stations, so it's not really left the area. We have a pretty mild Mediterranean climate here, which is easy on things, so that's good. Um, the person who donated this said that she has owned it for over 40 years and bought it from the original owners, and she really cherished it, and she didn't want to see it go, but I guess... She didn't explain her situation. She can't have this anymore, and so she wanted someone who loves these to take good care of it. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do a total overhaul of it. Uh, she said it worked when she had it. Well, she said it worked about 20 years ago, and then she stopped using it because the cord started not looking good. And I'm not. I'm probably not going to try to plug it in. These can be a big pain because. They tend to have the awful pre-war rubber-coated wiring that shatters if you look at it. And Philco seemed to be one of those companies that insisted on over-engineering things. Actually, you know what? Let me take my glasses off and look here. Is that cloth-coated wire? Yes. Being a 1940 set, maybe it doesn't have as much of that god-awful wiring in it. That's cloth. That's all cloth. That's good. Maybe there's hope. Um, this should be a pretty big thumping unit here. You've got dual outputs. So that's push-pull. I can't tell. It's been a long time since I worked on that. Is that possibly a dual rectifiers? I don't think so. That wouldn't make any sense. Let me look at the tube complement here. Let's see what we got going on. I know this is not very good lighting. 42s for the output. 37, 37, 37, 60... 7B, it's all the weird like Philco locked all tubes. It's interesting here, it says built for frequency sound and television sound and frequency modulation. The wireless way when used with Philco television picture receiver and FM converter. A lot of that never really happened because shortly after they started offering sets like this, World War II happened. And uh, at least for the U.S. anyway, the, the rest of the world has been in it for years, as I'd like to remind my fellow Americans who are watching. Well, anyway, um, after we got into the war, all this manufacturing just stopped. And we started making things like bullets and tanks and, and rations and stuff. So this was a pretty snazzy set when it was new. I'm really glad that the cabinet, again, is just like marvelous. And so I'm, in a few minutes, going to be reminded why I should not be working on this, because I'm going to be aggravated. Because as soon as I take that chassis out, I guarantee I'm going to be met with a freak show of wiring capacitors and stuff. All right, I've, there's something I remembered about this model. And this is important, because otherwise you're going to absolutely scratch your brain trying to figure out how to remove the chassis. You have to remove the metal escutcheon, and then there's two screw holes... You gotta remove those, and then you can pull the chassis out. Just, just take note of that. First time I did this, I spent an hour trying to figure out how to take it apart. All right, let's see what we're getting ourselves into here. First of all, the pilot light wiring is 
beyond wire anymore. This is a big whopper of a set. Uh, almost scared to take a look underneath, but let's see what kind of mischief we're going to get ourselves into on this one. Well, to my surprise, it's actually not that bad under here. It looks like we have quite a bit of cloth wiring, especially with the things like the speaker wiring. That obviously needs to be replaced. Unlike a lot of Philco's I've worked on, the caps are easy to get at. And, and when I'm looking here, this was looks like it was a majority recapped back in the uh, 50s or 60s. Those are much later caps. So are these. And you can see the original electrolytics lytic here is out of it's out of circuit. So it's had quite a bit of work done to it. These are later as well. These are probably original, as is this one. That's like a dry electrolytics, probably low voltage. We have the oh-so-famous Philco Bakelite block. There's only one in here, and seeing as that's the cord that goes in there, and that's the across-the-line cap. I don't even need to look that up. I know exactly what that is, because sometimes if you have a whole bunch of them in there, they have numbers embossed on the sides, and you need to look up to see what's inside that Bakelite plastic filled with tar. So that's a good sign that seems like someone really loved this radio because usually when I come in and see something like this, you'll have maybe some electrolytics replaced, not much else. But someone came in here and replaced everything except for these guys. So it was a majority recapped probably sometime in the 50s or 60s. So no wonder it still worked when she, the, the previous owner put it away 20 years ago. Uh, so where do we start? I think the easy thing to start with is, well, let's just go ahead and start replacing the electrolytics. Um, what do we have here? It's probably like 10 or 15 microfarads or something like that. 40 microfarads. All right. Well, you know what? That wiring is actually not that, that brittle. It's actually still kind of rubbery. That's good. Illinois Cap. I guess that stands for Illinois Condenser Company. I haven't heard of them before. But let's see here. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 caps. Not bad. Not bad at all. I worked on the bigger brother of this one that has motorized tuning, and it was a bitch. Then again, I'm trying to think. I haven't worked on one of these in such a long time, and I've done so many of these since then. Maybe it's just easier to do because I do so much of the stupid recapping stuff. But I'll shut up. Let's go ahead and replace these two guys, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, so we got the two electrolytics replaced. That wasn't too hard, pretty easy peasy. Let's twist these guys all around. It's like 0 .01010101, which is five of those in a row. So I'm gonna save my back and uh, some time by one head and got a whole bunch of those same values and we'll just replace all those guys. And then we'll continue on with these guys. Really not a whole lot going on in here. I'm kind of surprised. Didn't get very far last night. I uh, have to admit, actually, I'm trying to fix my own stereo system. I'm not sure if you guys, those have been watching my channel. I have a huge RCA Finlandia uh, stereo system, and one of my channels decided to mostly die. I've got a bad transistor. I replaced said transistor. It was gone bad because I had a bunch, two of these diodes here in my rectifier section went out. So I might have a, this is a driver. I think I might have a bad driver here. But that's neither here nor there. I don't have those parts on hand. I'm going to have to go to the museum later. So I'm going to focus instead on continuing recapping land. And what do we have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Hopefully there's not any caps buried in weird places. Looks like we had like 11 caps left to replace. And since I never actually filmed me doing this, I'm going to for once film a few of these being replaced. So that some of you guys, if you're new and you're not really sure 
what the protocol is, well, I can show you how I do it. There's there's other ways of doing it, but I'll show you how I did it. And meanwhile, I'll notice there's a spider. Clearly they hatched, just not in my garage. And I did a great job yesterday of spilling my beer all over the place over there and it stinks. Good job. So I'm gonna put this on a uh, camera holder and then I'll show you how I go about replacing these suckers. All right, so let's get cracking. So what I tend to do so I don't lose my space or my place is to identify the cap, first of all, by its value. I'll grab the appropriate value. And a rookie mistake that a lot of people make is they will, that rhymed, a rookie mistake that a lot of people will make. Anyway, I'll clip one end of one of the old capacitors and I'll leave a little bit of lead there so that when I look down again, I'll remember what was what. If you clip it down to where it's <clears throat> even, might lose your place. I know that sounds dumb, but you wouldn't believe how easy it is to do that. And then when your radio doesn't work, you have to figure out what the hell you just did. And um, people that start off doing this hobby tend to do that more. Um, and just later you get the hang of not losing your place. So now we've clipped one end. And now we'll clip the other. And you want to try to keep your leads as short as possible. If you make them unnecessarily long and gangly, that can interfere with your set's reception. Might get a little bit of interference. <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies are acting up. All right, so we got that soldered in. Looks like I dropped a little piece of solder down into this socket, actually. There we go. Got that out of there. I'll do a second one and then, you know, you'll get the idea. I don't need to show you how to do all these. In this case, this one has some old sleeving material. And I try to really just... Somehow a piece of sleeving material just fell off. Oh, it fell on my lap. I'll try to reuse it if I can because it was there for a purpose. Probably not to bang, wank, you know, bang up against anything that it's in the... Uh, on its path getting to where it needs to go so again we'll get one side and I'm just going to sleeve it down that wire like this get it pretty close to the original connection and then we'll solder it in and sometimes you have a big solder blob you want to make sure that you really melt everything together. It doesn't help that my, my Metcal soldering tip is getting kind of old. They last me about three months because I use it every day of the week and I'm using it on shit tons of old radios so they wear out quicker versus somebody working on a computer circuit board or something. Okay so again we sleeved that end. We got a little bit of an excessive lead there. Don't need that much. And let's bend this upward. And I'm making a little bit of a loop here. And then we'll go down. And again, we're going to crimp it as close as we can. And then do the same thing, solder it in. There we go. And what you want to do if you're not sure of your here, if it adheres not, you see this didn't adhere, it's still slipping around. I'll make sure everything is really molten and stuck together. The kid in this big wheel going by. If you're wondering what that noise is. Okay. So we have that cut into there. There you go. The kids are yelling dinosaur because we have a giant plastic dinosaur that my wife made in the front yard. And so all the neighborhood kids just love it. All right, so hopefully you get a clue, an idea of 
what I'm doing. If that makes sense. So I'm going to do the rest of these caps. Same procedure all the way through. Okay, so it is recapped. And I also replaced the cord on it. Do you need to replace the across the line cap at some point? But at this point, I just want to see if it works. And another thing, I didn't notice this until just now. <laughs> Someone added this switch here. I mean, whatever, it's on there pretty good. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Who knows how long that's been there? It's probably been there 50 years. I'm going to put this back in the cabinet. And uh, before I do that, I think I'm going to clean some of these contacts with some contact cleaner. Uh, maybe the volume pots, and then we'll put it in see what happens. All right, well, here goes nothing. I shoved it back in the cabinet. Sometimes these Loctol tubes make bad connections. Well, let's see what happens. I can't even tell if I turn that on. Yep, I see two filaments. Wendy's new French toast sticks are so delicious, some are saying that they're better than their mom's French. Excuse me. Go to host the Chicago Bears. Oh. Vincent, thank you so much. I hope that I can get... Both trust the ball to right field and high... To end Timmy's air out, yeah. like we need to get to a place where there's... Yeah, it works pretty good. I think all my pilot lights are burned out, but that's not unusual. I think now that it's working, I'm going to take the chassis out and clean it up and clean all the tube sockets and stuff, because there was a little bit of greedy, staticky stuff going on there. Okay, so the next stage is to start working on the cabinet. Because basically, the electronics are on a good way. And so I'm going to use first a product called Old English. No idea why they call it Old English. It's an American product. But anyway, maybe it denotes like Old English furniture or something. But it works great, whatever it is, for bringing back a lot of the faded coloration, coloring in the scratches. Even though this really doesn't have that many scratches on it. Whoever had it took very good care of it. It's actually uncanny how great of condition it really is. But you want to go over the whole thing with it, and you can see how it just kind of evens everything out. I'm going to go over the whole thing with this and apply it fairly liberally and let it soak overnight. Welcome to day three of working on the Big Philco, and I got quite a bit done last night. First of all, the entire chassis has been recapped and cleaned. There is this strange additional light here, and I'm not sure where it goes. I'm wondering if maybe somehow it came loose from somewhere, but I need to figure out where it goes, because the rest of the pilot lights are here. We've got the two on the sides here, and then we have the moving pilot light that indicates the band. So I'm not exactly sure where that's supposed to go. Guess I'll have to figure it out. Maybe I'll look up to see if there's a schematic for this thing. I need to replace the rotten wiring for the, the pilot lamp in the front. So meanwhile what I'm going to do is start working on the case. Last night I applied a whole bunch of Old English I think I might need to apply a little bit more to the bottom here, but the finish is in such good shape that the Old English didn't really soak in that much. I might touch it up just a little bit, and then it's gonna, I'm going to get out the orbital buffer. Even I'm not sure if the orbital buffer is going to do much good. It'll do fine on the sides and the top. These guys, I'm going to probably have to do it by hand. Let me get a little more of the Old English and make sure I've really wiped it down good before I start this process. All right, <clears throat> let's see if my camera lens is clean. This is turning out to be one of the nicest original finishes I've worked on. There's a little scuffs on the bottom, that's not unusual, but it's... For a 1940-era radio, for an 80-year-old radio, that's, that's kind of crazy. 
what I am going to do is I'm going to take the, this off because I don't want to damage it and um, I'm going to go over this whole thing with my mechanical buffer. I meant to get more car wax so I'm going to start off with liquid wax and then work my way into paste wax which is going to be more difficult but whatever. It's worth it. So I'm going to take the handle off and what I'm going to do is use my buffer here. It's a multi-speed orbital waxer with the pad and uh, saves you a lot of time instead of doing it by hand. All right, so I've applied one application. I just put my uh, orbital buffer kind of on medium. Just kind of go over the whole thing like this. Just take your time. Let the machine do its work. Or let the machine do the work for you. That's what you do. I'm going to let this dry, and then I'll take out my cloth and remove the first layer. The first layer is usually the worst because it's mixed with... Uh, Old English and wax, so it's a little, it's a little sticky and oily. But then once you get that off, the next few coats will go on and come off a lot easier. All right, so I spent quite a bit of quality time polishing this guy up, and they usually don't, they don't come this nice. This is highly unusual as far as the amount of gloss and finish. It's just, it's perfect. I'll have to take it out in the sun when I get done with it. But I've got some more work to do on the chassis. First of all I need to replace the rotten rubber wiring that goes to the pilot light and also there's a couple of capacitors that I didn't get that are <clears throat> attached to the tone and volume pot. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then what I also want to do is add a safety fuse and run an audio in, an audio cable in. I think it might be this connection. I could be wrong. I'll have to take a look. And I also need to find where in the heck that goes, it's a mystery, but we'll figure it out. Those two caps are the most hateful little things to replace. I mean, just getting in here with my soldering iron, I barely was able to get in there, but I did it. Now, for just one thing I forgot. <clears throat> we still have the across the line cap, which is that Bakelite block. And... You leave that in there and not replace it, that's a great way for something to go bang all of a sudden and scare the crap out of you and make a nasty smell. Previously what I used to do <clears throat> is I would just drill out the rivets on the Bakelite block, assuming that the connections inside were disconnected. And by mistake what I discovered is like not always, in fact some of the, I think what happened is that the foil that was wrapped around the caps all got ground up and then I turned one radio on there was a little bit of a snap. And there's just a little piece, a few pieces of foil that were inside that block that just so happened to be touching the underside of one of these guys. So you got to take the tar out of them. And I'll show you how to do that. I hate doing it. Luckily, there's only one in this set. All right, so here's what we're going to do. First of all, I disconnected the uh, plug wire. <clears throat> it goes right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill out the centers of all these rivets. And I used to just do that and call it a day, but I'm gonna when you when I find when you drill these guys out, it kind of breaks up the tar inside. Just like that. I'm gonna do it to all three of these rivets. And then I'm gonna unbolt this and pull the bake like block off and see if I can dig the tar out of there. Alright, here it is with all this disgusting tar. You can see when I drilled through it, it poked a lot of it out. And uh, what I tend to do is get a sharp screwdriver and just kind of like poke around the edges until I can cause the form to crack free. Sometimes I'll crack the bake light block. It's not a big deal as long as you don't do it anywhere structural, but they're fragile, so be careful. Uh, okay, well, I've been digging for gold, and here is the uh, end result here. Here is the two original paper caps that they buried in tar in there. Little did the genius Philco engineers know what pain and misery these little things cause, but you want to disconnect those entirely. Just take them out of there and then we'll bolt this back in and we'll put the caps on top. Some people are like, no, I want to put it, you know, like underneath where it's hidden. I say, who cares? No one else is going to look at this for another 50 years, so what does it matter? All right, welcome back to day four or five. I can't keep track anymore with how many days I've spent on this thing. And uh, what I did is I added an audio input feature 
the gain wasn't quite what I wanted and so I put in this isolation transformer with a pretty tight um, ratio it's 120 volts in 6 volts out that is the ratio it's going to boost my signal just a, a little bit um, and what I also did is you want to put a resistor that is half the value of the volume pot's resistance and then a 0 .02 rated cap. This set definitely has an automatic gain control feature and leaving this um, transformer in circuit would interfere with radio reception just a little bit. So that puts a shunt there. The set has a button to turn um, you know, radio off and phonograph on. So we don't need to add a, an additional switch. We'll just use this here. I hope this works. It It's a nice big speaker, and I just hope that this is going to boost it enough to make it worthwhile. We'll see. I'm going to put it back in the set. We'll need to make a holder for this cable so that it doesn't get yanked on and yanked out of the out of the set. Uh, but we'll come to that in just a little bit. I'm going to try it out and see if it works. All right, well, that kind of worked, but it's a little too much. I think that uh, ratio is not the right ratio. I'm not a mathematician or an engineer, but I think probably I'm at the back it up to 12 volts output versus the 6 volt output. It's uh, too much. Putting injecting too much of a signal is causing some weird distortion, which I don't care for. Yeah, a little too harsh. That switch is still fucking dirty as hell. That's annoying. Oh well. Alright, well this is a little aggravating. I've spent the last hour absolutely cleaning the crap out of all the controls. There was a lot of little cat whisker metal shavings or metal bits. And I had a hard time flushing it out because I can't get to the volume pots very easily. I also discovered I had one loose solder connection here. It wasn't quite going all the way. Still not perfect, but we're getting there. At least I can turn it up here. So it sounded better. You see that? I was holding the speaker with one hand and the other hand I was using my fingers off my phone to uh, turn the wheel. That's not very impressive. Anyway, I'm going to do a little more work on it. And as soon as I get this reliable enough, I'm going to do final reassembly. Alright, so I got the stupid noise to stop and now the last thing I need to do is rewire this guy. I'm not as familiar with this kind of plug. I'm hoping I can get that thing apart without having to break it. Otherwise I'll have to find another way to shove a light in that hole. But, I don't know, we gotta have that pilot light working. This is the last thing I'll do on this thing before it's time to put it back in the cabinet which I really can't wait to do because it's going to be a beautiful piece, but let's try to replace this light, or this wiring. Oh, welcome to the next day of working on this. And I didn't film much of what happened yesterday, but basically as a recap, I spent most of the day tracking down random static sounds that were coming out of the controls. I ultimately found that there were two very skinny hairline wires that were going to one of these push buttons and they were just so everly slightly bumping up against each other. That solved that problem. The issue I have now, and I'm not sure if it's really an issue, I think it has to do with how this set was engineered to work with an audio input. Here it says television. I assumed incorrectly that the way that worked is it cut off your RF. But because this was intended to have uh, your phonograph or television sound brought in wirelessly via radio, radio still comes in through that switch. So my audio is not overriding the signal because I'm going through an isolation transformer and that dampens down the amount of, of um, impedance that I have. In other words, the level of current coming from that signal, it's not going to override the uh, RF frequency. So yesterday, I'd, you know, I worked on it all day, and it was really frustrating. And so I decided, I'm frustrated. I'm going to rush on it and do something stupid, so I quit working on it. So I'm hoping today I can solve 
the issue. I'm going to take the speaker and the chassis out so I can nip it in the bud, get everything working, and then put it back together again. So I'm thinking probably another hour I'll have it solved, and then I can go into other things. Meaning, I don't buy radios for myself that often, but I bought this. It's got an issue, unfortunately. The speaker fell out when it got shipped, but I can uh, put that back in. It's a Tonberg. Tonberg. Norwegian, I believe. I can't remember if it's Norwegian or what, but I'll, I'll look it up. That's another episode, but in the meantime, let's uh, get back to the Philco. Okay, I got it playing relatively good now. I think what it is, since I had all these contact issues, my audio initially when I ran it through direct wasn't really working that well. So I decided to try going in direct again, minus the isolation transformer. And it works great. Um, that's going to cut off any radio signal automatically, so I don't need to worry about cooking up some weird switch or something. So I'm going to install it back in the cabinet, hook up all the antenna and wires and everything without bolting it in, and make sure it works. And if it does, then I'll feel a lot better about it. All right, she's done. <laughs> I thought I had it in the can two days ago. I was like, oh, this is a cinch. It's working. Yay. Sometimes it's that last little 10% stretch that gets you in the end. So I actually spent more, I spent more time fixing the last little problems on this to get it to work perfect. But I think it's worth it. I mean, look at this thing. It looks like it came out of the factory yesterday. And um, you can see me reflected in it. It's like, it literally looks like glass. Um, for a finish to survive that well, it's just unheard of. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Thanks for bearing with me. Now it's time to go something fun, which is put lights up on my house. Yay! All right, if you have any questions, you can ask them below. I'll try to get to them, even though these days I've been so busy with a new job, I just I can't as much. Um, but until the next time a radio comes across the workbench, I'll see you guys next time. Adios!